Hi, hi everyone. This is Ilya and Alex from Near, and we're today with Tim from Sela. Going to be talking about how Sela works, and uh, yeah, you can introduce yourself, and we can dive in. Yeah, great to be here. Um, so I'm Tim Morton. I'm on the engineering team at Sela. Um, before this, I uh, ran a bunch of teams at Apple, running their cloud infrastructure, and I have a background in distributed systems. So when you guys start grilling me on like the economics, we'll see how we'll see how <laughs> that goes. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk about Celo. Celo is a permissionless platform to. Uh, uh, should I be talking to you or the camera? Sorry. For intro, you can talk to the camera. Yeah. Okay. For for the details, we can yeah. Have okay. Around. Cool. So Celo is a permissionless platform making financial tools available to everybody worldwide uh, from a mobile phone. Basically, predicated on the fact that like low-end smartphones are far more widely available and far, far more widely uh, used by people than uh, bank accounts. Like there are 1.7 billion people without access to regular financial services. And if we can close that gap a little bit and empower some people to be able to like send money between friends and pay at merchants and like have access to all the things that we're used to, um, then that would be like a great achievement. Yeah. Cool. All right. Do you want to describe kind of what are the main yeah. components and then we yeah. can dive in into... Yeah. So one of the things that's interesting about Cello in this space is we're very much like a product company. We're mm -hmm. focused on like trying to make uh, an end user experience, which is uh, so seamless that you don't even really know that there is a cryptocurrency mm -hmm. or a decentralized backend, um, you know, under, under the covers. And so we, we think a lot about like user experience and we think a lot about the sort of particular set of assumptions that we need to make um, given that virtually all of our users will be like accessing Celo from a mobile mm -hmm. device, uh, especially like a low end mobile device. So we care about like, you know, weak connectivity, um, how much data we're transferring, um, how much processing power. And you know, that's like, you know, pr presents some interesting technical challenges. So to do that, we've sort of taken this like whole stack approach. Um, you can sort of think of uh, Celo as like uh, three things. Um, so the bottom layer is like the blockchain. So we call this like Celo blockchain. Um, I'll come back and like describe these things in a bit more detail in a second. So then we have like a smart contract layer. Which is really like most of the business logic of the, of the stack. And then <clears throat> we have a uh, Cello wallet mm -hmm. app, and the uh, obviously most of our users like sort of s sit here and using their, their uh, using their sort of uh, devices. This you can sort of think of this as like a platform in itself. Um, there's like a lot of uh, opportunities to build like other things both directly on top of the smart contract layer. Um, anybody of course can deploy smart contracts to the platform. But also, um, we have a uh, so we have like a couple of things to make that easier. We have, um, uh, I guess, you can sort of think of it as being like here. This is where the diagram gets a little confusing. <laughs> this is like I guess contract kit, mm -hmm. which is a layer to make it really easy to like access the sort of first party contracts that exist in, in the business logic layer here, and then um, the wallet also uses that. And then the wallet as well exposes this thing called DAP kit, which makes it easy to build like essentially third party uh, applications on the platform, like mobile apps, mm -hmm. which, you know, maybe they need to like send a payment or maybe they just need to find out your um, like uh, account details so that they can do other stuff. So what you could basically DAP kit allows like, you know, say a micro lending app or um, some other kind of like third party ecosystem app to be able to like connect to your wallet with your permission, of course, um, like sign a transaction or like get your account details. And so it makes it super, super simple to like build apps on mm -hmm. top. Um, also behind the, the wallet uh, in terms of, let me just stick this thing over here. There's a nice little cloud. Um, there are a few things we have like sitting in the background, which are like centrally managed services. So the Celo protocol is like an open framework. Um, uh, Celo will have like a, a, a foundation that governs it. And like, this will be not just open source, but of course, open runtime and fully mm -hmm. decentralized. 
The wallet, of course, are this um, uh, uh, the wallet. There could be many wallets. We hope there will be, um, but like the wallet that us at uh, C Labs are building uh, has a few sort of uh, cloud services behind it to facilitate things which are really hard to do in a decentralized way. Mm -hmm. So for example, push notifications. If I send you some money, like we have a cloud service which is watching the blockchain. Yeah, blockchain. Pushes uh, exactly, exactly. And so like then basically talks to uh, a service here, uh, talks to like Google or um, Apple or whatever, mm -hmm. and sends a push notification to the wallet saying, hey, um, like Tim has just yeah. paid you, like whatever. Um, and so there's a couple of things there. So they're really around like optimizing user experience and around performance. Um, but broadly, everything is like decentralized. So the smart contract layer is like the sort of business logic layer. I'll come back to like dig into that in a yeah. second. Yeah, let's um, go. Let's talk about, yeah, let, let's get to the heart of it. So the blockchain is, um, so the blockchain is actually a fork of the Go Ethereum client. Mm -hmm. um, this is an incredibly like ambitious project. There's a lot, there's a big, big surface area. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was because we care a lot about user experience was to try and like get to market as quickly as possible. And so um, we looked around uh, rather than building like a blockchain from scratch ourselves, we looked to sort of build on some of the great technology that's already been built out there in the crypto space. Um, and Ethereum was like the obvious like platform of choice just because of um, the length of time it's been in production like the sort of robustness of the implementations, the fact it has a like smart contract platform with a broadly supported set of like developer tool chain above mm -hmm. it. Um, uh, and, and so like that felt like a great starting point for us. And so building on the sort of shoulders of giants and we, we, we took the Go Ethereum code base and then basically looked at what we would need to do to make this work really well from this set of assumptions that we knew that we had from, from the end users. Um, so that's really about like making this thing mobile first mm -hmm. and um, you know we recognize as well that the Ethereum community has generated tons of great ideas over the past few years and not, certainly not all of them have really made their way actually back into the into like the implementation the agreed protocol yeah. spec of Ethereum um, and so there are a bunch of things that we like have taken um, like inspired by those sorts of ideas which I can talk more about um, but yeah, broadly, it's around like changes for usability, mm -hmm. changes for mobile, uh, being mobile first. Um, and then also, like, I think since Ethereum was um, arranged, like the thinking in general in the space around proof of work versus proof of stake has moved on a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the big changes we made was to, proof of stake. Yeah, was to take proof of work out and, and make proof of stake. So how, how did, yeah, maybe I'll, let's dig into yeah. that. How, how yeah. did you update uh, yeah. Ethereum to proof of stake? Because how do we, how do we, <laughs> how do we do that? So we started <laughs> off, so, you know, um, I remember there's a, uh, there's a quote on, uh, I think it is, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it is the uh, curator recipe page for using Zookeeper. So, you know, I have a lot of experience with Zookeeper, a lot of experience, like, I, I mean, for my sins, I once implemented, like, twice, actually, for my sins, implemented Paxos. So, mm -hmm. like, it's a complete pain <laughs> to have to do. And I think the curator page says it quite nicely. It's like, um, good friends don't let their friends implement Zookeeper recipes. <laughs> and I think the same can be applied to, like, distributed consensus. It's really, really... Uh, gnarly there are tons of edge cases uh, there are very few people in the world who really like deeply understand it maybe you guys do um, I think like you know obviously <laughs> obviously I think we um, I'm selling ourselves short I think we 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 have gained that experience but in order in order to like um, get further faster we mm -hmm. sort of looked around to see whether that was a good starting point mm -hmm. so we actually started with the um, uh, PR that was raised as I think EIP 650, mm -hmm. which was called Istanbul, confusingly not, yeah. not the, the Istanbul that actually happened. Uh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Not the, um, not the Istanbul that has, um, the sort of, uh, the, 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 the hard fork, the, the fork of uh, Ethereum, um, that's happening right now. Um, but actually a separate implementation of a, um, practical Byzantine fault tolerant like mm -hmm. consensus mechanism uh, on the existing sort of uh, consensus interface inside the Go Ethereum client. Mm -hmm. And so luckily the Go Ethereum client has this sort of 
um, ability to yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. switch a little because bit, it yeah. supports proof of authority. Mm -hmm. It's got the ETH hash and like the um, yes, yeah, so there's already like a few a few implementations in there, and uh, Istanbul plugged into that, but it was never merged. Um, the code was like eighteen months out of date. <laughs> um, it was also incorrect um, <laughs> because it's really hard to write these yeah. things. Um, kudos to the, to, uh, the original authors. They did a, they did a, um, a, a great job. Um, but yeah, there were some edge cases we wanted to pick up. Um, it was also like piggybacked on, uh, Ethereum's exist, uh, sorry, the Go Ethereum client's existing gossip mm -hmm. mechanism and a couple of other bits and pieces, which meant that from a performance perspective, we it were not going slow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it ended up just basically generating way more messages um, than necessary. And, um, and then there were also like a few security things mm -hmm. in there as well. So not only were there like direct security bugs, um, like just just straight up bugs that would affect security, but there were also um, uh, like a few opportunities for denial of service attacks, mm -hmm. which were sort of in, in the code base. So we, we took that code as a like great starting point, and we've done a lot of work to make that um, a sort of Byzantine full torrent um, consensus implementation like inside um, the Golang code base of the Celo blockchain. So pretty much using PBFT for production. What's what's kind of the like the basic parameters of that? Yeah. So um, yeah, let's uh, <laughs> let's call that PBFT down here. Was one of the things. So in terms of parameters, you mean like what are we expecting in terms of number of validators or like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like what's the rotation mechanism? What's uh, yeah. yeah? So all, all those details that actually but, but like. Before we jump into yeah. fun, I obviously <laughs> have my, my, my favorite question whenever we talk about PBFT. Why not Tendermint? Yeah, great great question. What what is, what is any reason in this world not to use Go Tendermint? We right. So we actually we did look at um, whatever it was called at the time, uh, Ethermint, I think, mm -hmm. um, and. We talked, I think, to um, the people involved in that project. Um, it was a really nice proof of concept, but it really, um, the, the, the API around Tendermint was actually very, like while in like separately, it's actually quite a nice way of plugging in blockchains into a PBFT system. Um, it unfortunately was very tricky to integrate that into the, the Geth code base. So that was like our sort of, looking at it like on our own that was our estimation of it and i think um looking at ethermint and then talking to the folks involved in that project they found the same thing so yeah because we Ilya, Ilya built in, in eight hours mm -hmm. tendermint with the with, with our runtime. runtime yeah with web assembly and all of the transaction processing awesome. and then plugged and in all like this february right so i guess yeah we this february it was pretty mature yeah we were doing this a little bit earlier but, um, because, because so PBFT, my concern with PBFT is A, mm -hmm. view change is practically impossible to write correctly. Mm. It's extremely complex. B, view change is going to be barely be barely tested because in the normal circumstances, mm -hmm. view changes don't happen, right? Mm -hmm. And the normal circumstances, like in, in, the, in the Cosmos lifetime, mm -hmm. we had, I think, at least like mm -hmm. last time we talked to them, they had like how many? 100? Yeah, they had 100. 100 yeah. times they mm -hmm. went to the second. So, mm -hmm. so like, well, in PBFT would have been a view change. It happened yep. 100 times yep. out of like, you know, hundreds of thousands. Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating the total yep. number, but it's, it's very rare. So the, right? the, yeah. the, the trick with, yeah, I mean, so like you can write a, 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 a sort of a pseudocode implementation mm -hmm. of PBFT in like, you know, a few hundred lines, but the devil is in the detail in the implementation. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and Istanbul was not straight up PBFT either, um, but Istanbul also had the advantage that there were two other teams like in the broader ecosystem who were using it, scrutinizing it, and looking mm. at it. But, but I guess another concern is PBFT doesn't have proven liveness, right? To, to mm. the best of my knowledge, the, so the original paper certainly doesn't have proof for liveness. It has an argument, but uh, I, I might be wrong. But I'm I'm like ninety five percent certain PBFT never actually never mm. proved liveness. But mm. last question before we jump yeah. into fun. There were rumors of seller using hot stuff. Uh huh. So PBFT is not hot stuff, right? So, so PBFT is not hot stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I think hot stuff <laughs> is like a really interesting paper. So yeah. So let's let's talk about like the plan right now, and mm -hmm. then the plan like going mm -hmm. forward. Um, so PBFT in general, BFT has like limitations in terms of the scalability because of, like the complexity of the message mm -hmm. can blow out yeah. complexity. <laughs> Um, but it's a very proven algorithm that's been implemented a number of times 
in this space and outside of this space um, has good pedigree from that perspective. Um, hot stuff is really interesting. It we like obviously like Libra uh, have been one of the first to actually like really implement it in this space. Of course, that project is not fully live yet either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I think at the time that we were making this decision, like it felt it was very like um, it was very tentative, right? And uh, it would be ex very interesting. You could imagine in the future, like swapping out PPFT for a hot stuff based implementation and getting a bunch of benefits for that. In fact, um, you can find that we've done a bunch of work. Like there's two tracks in which we're doing this. One is like, we want to ship, as I was talking about, we're a product company, we care about our users. Like um, I've learned many times in the last 15 don't, years. Don't, don't keep iterating don't if you keep, have something working. Yeah, like <laughs> don't keep improving performance. Don't keep trying to like add extra features, like get to market, talk to your users, understand what matters to them, right? And like, unless you can draw a really, really clear line from what this person here cares about down to here, <laughs> then you're wasting your time. And um, for us, like hot stuff has like a bunch of really interesting potential benefits. Um, so we have this two track approach where like, this is, you know, this is what's on the back of the truck at the moment. And this is what we're like going, going to market with. But at the same time, there is, uh, you know, we've been doing a bunch of work around uh, an algorithm called BF tree, which um, aims to use hot stuff to be able to scale permissionless, uh, a permissionless approach to uh, cons consensus for like potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of participants uh, where they can just like join, um, form a sort of tree structure. And in so doing, we don't have to have a lot of the complexities of a proof of stake mechanism on top of a BFT algorithm to determine who yeah. the participants in the in the algorithm actually are. And so in sense. blockchain, every block is finalized? Uh-huh. I, I see. So, so like someone proposes a block, mm -hmm. it's BFT, and it's final, then the next block is proposed, That's right. et cetera. Yeah, yep. exactly. So there's no pipelining at the moment. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, hot stuff happens? is basically just pipeline. Pipeline, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's still... Without view changes. Without right. view changes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I guess is also... So, I mean, to be... <laughs> the other benefit of, like, nailing this down early was that we've been able to do a ton of, like, load testing, failure testing on, like, very large clusters mm -hmm. and being able to, like, put this through its paces in terms of many, like, practical... Uh, sort of settings and scenarios. Like we found a ton of issues, none of them, not none of, but like almost all of them were outside of the scope of the core algorithm. It's like, you yeah, know. The, the issues are in like networking. That's right, in... that's right, that's right. It's it's all the auxiliary stuff which um, which makes a big difference. Is there a concept of an epoch when validators mm -hmm. don't change? Uh, yep, so we have, yeah, so before we, maybe before we dive more into that, let me just sort of flesh out what, what this thing is here. So smart contracts, obviously, um, uh, this is smart contracts using the regular EVM. Mm -hmm. So like any of the sort of standard tool chain that you use for developing yeah, smart contracts work, yeah. in Ethereum will just work out of the box. And so you have like account IDs, which are like hashes of the public keys and exactly. all the usual yeah. stuff. Exactly, yeah. Um, and so contract kit, in fact, like embeds Web3, and you can also mm -hmm. go and do your own thing with that. Um, but the smart, smart contracts, like, of course, people will add smart contracts. There's no restriction on that. But, like, the the ones that sort of are, like, out of the box mm -hmm. in Celo fall into, like, such three categories. So that's first, which is, like, around proof of stake and governance. Mm -hmm. So the proof of stake mechanism is entirely implemented in smart contracts. And there's an on-chain governance mechanism as well. Benefit of, like, obviously putting things in this layer rather than this layer is that you can use this on-chain governance mechanism to replace it without a hard fork. Mm -hmm. um, sort of a little thing up here uh, to that point is like params. I guess that's way too small to read. Sorry about <laughs> that, everybody at home. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, for example, one of the things with that Ethereum has been like yeah, battling with is hard, like yeah. block gas limit, you know, all miners, please. And like I saw Vitalik encouraging mining pools to like, you well, know, actually block limit, larger. block limit is something that is votable. It's votable, but in a but sort they of, don't just, but it's not by the participants in, it's not by like, this is, this is governance by cello gold holders, yeah, yeah, by yeah. the entire community. Like, you know, you've seen the the situation. Yeah. that's right. So like you've seen a situation in Ethereum where miners are holding 
like um, the rest of the network, I won't say to ransom, but you know what I mean, like they have control over that particular parameter. So this, this sort of puts these things out in the open um, and means that you can change a bunch of these parameters without having to like hard fork or um, even in many cases update the, the client, which is, which is quite nice. Um, so having made this too small to be legible, I'm gonna um, erase it. <laughs> Here there's a second thing, which is the sort of stable coin um, uh, protocol, which we'll come back and chat about, and then identity as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, proof of stake and governance. So this is really the, so yeah, so leaving aside governance for now, proof of stake here is like the mechanism by which you um, decide who gets to participate in this protocol, as you, as you guys know. Um, we have implemented a quite interesting like proof of stake, um, I guess, protocol. We've been um, thinking about the, um, the scheme that we want to use for like a long time. We've been talking to a lot of people and iterating on it, trying to pick some of the best aspects of like what we've seen succeed in like systems like Cosmos and Tezos and um, in other in other systems that have had a bunch of like experience in the wild, um, talking to a lot of folks um, and also introducing like a bunch of our own ideas. And we, we I actually wrote a couple of blog posts about that like just last week and we're going to be going to a uh, sort of beta net called Backlava, an incentivized test net where we're going to run a a challenge called the Great Cello Stake Off, which is, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, has obviously British connotations. Um, but the <laughs> idea of the idea of the Stake Off is really to get validated, to, to get some like airtime for this proof of stake mechanism, yeah, yeah. to get broader input on it from the community, to get validators' operational experience mm -hmm. like running the network, and also like give them the opportunity to potentially win prizes um, that can convert into like gold on on mainnet potentially so yeah um so yeah <laughs> so yeah so let's dig into the proof of stake protocol so um uh, validators are basically elected by hey let's move over here <laughs> validators are basically elected by here's validator validators are basically elected by solo gold holders um or hogglers as we would like to like to get them to be affectionately named. Um, so obviously, so the, the native token is actually gold, right? So solo gold is the native token. Yeah. Like you can think of that as equivalent to ether. Yeah, in, yeah, in yeah Ethereum. Exactly. Um, it is slightly slight tangent. One thing we've done is also make that ERC twenty compatible. Mm -hmm. So there is this like duality. You can use it via an ERC twenty yeah, interface. Yeah, but you have an interface. API, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also like the native mm -hmm. token. Is it pegged to gold? Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question around the naming. It is definitely not pegged okay. to gold. It is definitely not pegged to gold. Um, yeah, so it's the native utility token of the platform. Um, solo gold holders are essentially the voters mm -hmm. in the system that can select the validators. Um, but they do so via a, a election mechanism in which they vote for validated groups. Mm -hmm. um, to Obviously, we have a situation whereby um, you know, this is a decentralized platform. Anyone can create any number of accounts. We can't do like one person, one one user, yeah. one vote. So, you know, the only way that we in the community know how to do this right now is to like, stake, yeah. have, have voting by balances. Yeah. And of course, to prevent people vote with a balance and then transfer it to a different account and then vote with that same balance again, essentially, we require them to like lock up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't call... One interesting difference with Celo compared to other networks that you're probably expecting is when uh, Celo gold holders lock up uh, a balance, they are not putting that balance at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so no matter who they vote for, that um, balance can't be slashed. Mm -hmm. So we we uh, we think that's an important decision because Celo gold holders don't have, um, you know, you don't have if if you're just an average voter, if you're this person up here you probably don't know and don't like you know, yeah, participation you don't have, you don't have, yeah you don't, you don't have, have the expertise or necessarily choose, yeah. the time to be able to let alone the, the visibility there's like mm -hmm. um yeah there's big imbalance in the information that you have about whether these guys are doing the, the right thing or mm -hmm. not um and so what you do is you like 
Um, so we have a locked gold contract. Uh, you basically like lock um, some gold in lock gold contract, and then that allows you to vote. But mm -hmm. what you're voting for is actually a validator group. And a validator group is this sort of new concept, which I don't think um, any other network really has, which is, I guess, a wrapper around a set of validators. Mm -hmm. And now you might imagine these things coming about in two different ways. Maybe there's a like um, uh, a group of like a valid, a valid, an entity or an organization that runs validators, maybe more like the sort of professionalized validators that you're seeing Cosmos, where they may want to run more than one validator. And uh, so they may want to run a validator group, have valid, like have validators um, in, in their validator group and potentially be able to swap these validators out if they need to. Um, and um, yeah, then basically like put themselves forward as a, as, as, as a group. Alternatively, you may see validator groups that don't run validators themselves, but provide a service where they are, um, you know, doing things like security audits, mm -hmm. like KYC on validators. So they're just like source validators and then yeah. kind of package them into a group. Right, so the idea is that these things have like a reputation, mm -hmm. like name recognition, like um, long-term persistence in the mm -hmm. network. These are, folks that you're voting for. So you know, maybe like uh, a slight, somewhat loose analogy is they may be like a political party mm -hmm. whereby like if you vote Democrat, like maybe there are some people who vote Democrat or Republican or whatever. Independent of who the members are. Exactly, are, just yeah. Because of, uh, yeah, exactly. And so you're, um, you're sort of relying on them to do a bunch of like, um, uh, well, marketing. You are maybe maybe <laughs> maybe marketing, but I was going to say vetting, mm -hmm. right? So like you know they have a reputation mm -hmm. to preserve. They are not going to put somebody on their slate who, um, hopefully, they're not going to put somebody on their slate that um, is actually actually uh, not reputable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so they have this better ability as well to make sure that a validator is actually doing what you would expect them to, because the, for a validator to be elected, they need a validator group, right? So mm -hmm. there is a sort of admission control system here, whereby like a validator basically needs to say, I want to be part of this validator group, and the validator group needs to add them. And what that means is that they have the opportunity to do things like, oh, KYC, oh, let me come and do a security audit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, are these things that you're actually doing? Let's look at that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, at the moment, probably we're gonna have like five validators as, as a limit in, in a validator group. Um, and yeah, uh, validator groups are the things that need to put up a stake, mm -hmm. and validators also need to put up a stake. And uh, the validator group stake is per validator as well. So um, yeah, if they have like you know three validators here, say v two v three, then like maybe they need to put up like three units of stake mm -hmm. or whatever. But, but it's an addition, so every validator stake, and then validator group as it's on itself also stake extra mm -hmm. on top of that. Per each validator. Absolutely, per each yeah, yeah absolutely. So the stake is, um, so the stake is like uh, the, the combination of this amount here and this amount mm -hmm. here. Um, and the, the way that you put up a stake is that you do you go through this same mechanism here. Mm -hmm. So you lock gold and then that gold, the benefit of having a unified lock gold mechanism is then that you can also use it to participate in governance. Mm -hmm. You can use it to uh, participate in validator elections. You can also use it as a stake for a validator group mm -hmm. or validator. Yeah. Cool, so just like coming um, to look at what happens next, you then get to, uh, once you've locked up, you then basically get to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, you put a vote okay. forward for a validator group. So you can vote for one group or? Uh, you can actually vote for three. Um, uh, originally we had one, but like you can now vote for three. And the reason for this is that um, we recognize that the security of the system really depends on, um, well, let, let's have a look at a normal election, right? So. If this is like the distribution here of votes that are received for like you know parties or candidates in mm -hmm. an election, right? Um, like I don't know. It's a, this is not rank. a bad country, I, I must say. Um, <laughs> we're coming from countries where it's very different distribution. <laughs> there we go. One candidate. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Anyway, uh, so this is rank here, right? And this is uh, this is votes. Um, I, I love a good bogey yeah, we, graph. Yeah, we, we're coming from a country where so this is so this is hundred percent. Uh, it's like this. Yes. Nice. <laughs> so this is like 146 to be right. 
So say you're a bad actor and you want to get a validator elected, yeah, so that you can start doing malicious things. Of course, a lot of the security of this um, protocol here depends mm -hmm. on making sure that um, one third of validators, no more than one third of validators, are malicious. Yeah, and that's critical. Like the, the that's the the behavior of individual nodes is more important than in comparative proof of work schemes, mm -hmm. of course. One, one third is also bad. One third is extremely bad. Yeah. Um, hopefully, hopefully very small numbers. Anyway, um, so to get your validator elected, you don't need to beat um, this candidate here. You need to beat like number 100. Say we're going to have 100 validators. You need to like have more votes than this candidate mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. right? And so um, the ideal graph distribution from a security point of view would actually be much more like just even, yeah. this, right? So votes up here for these guys they're are like essentially, extra, yeah. yeah, they're like superfluous, they're wasted. They don't contribute to the security of the system. Like, especially because we, from a decentralization point of view, it's important to us that we have a bunch of different organizations, individuals participating and contributing and operating validators and validator groups. And so we have this like limit. And so basically we actually limit the number of votes that a validator group can receive, mm -hmm. such that they can only receive um, the number of votes required to elect one more than the number of validators that they're like fielding in the election, right? So um, if this one was fielding like three validators as it is, it can only receive essentially enough votes to elect four validators. But, but what happens if one more vote is actually coming? Uh, we just say no. <laughs> we basically say, thanks you for your vote. You cannot cast your vote. <laughs> thanks for your vote. Please vote again. Um, and, and it's not like we don't, if but, you already but, but voted that for it. It's an interesting me mechanic, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, imagine imagine there's like a bunch of people uh, who want to vote for uh, for like a validator number one and validator number two. Like, let, let's mm -hmm. use different colors. So, so, different colors, sorry. So, there's a bunch of these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, also, people who like validator number two, they generally. They, they're hustlers, they do everything fast. Mm -hmm. And there's another group which wants to vote for number one, and let's use a square head, and for number three, uh, and they, like, if you if you like number two, you're slow, mm -hmm. is a correlation. Okay. And all of these guys voted for one. Okay, maybe a little lost with the shapes of heads here, but yeah, okay, cool. Sorry, let's, so let's use numbers. Just use okay. numbers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, two, three. It's a very artificial example, I don't think it's yep. actual concern, but, but you see, if these guys all voted first, mm -hmm. they all voted for one. You're right. Two did not receive their votes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the votes for one are not received anymore, but only these guys are left, they all vote for yeah, three. You're right. And two who was also... Yeah, so I, unfortunately... I, it's, I don't really actually believe in yeah. this concern myself. <laughs> I don't think it's a problem, but I think you're right that there are some dynamics. Yeah. Like there are some time dynamics in the system. Uh, yeah, and this is why we, coming back to your question, this is why we allow you to vote for three groups. Like mm. especially if you like have a lot of cello gold, it may not be possible to find So when find I vote a group here, can... my vote will actually go to both one and two. Uh, what it was so two like is a group is, or two one is a validator. Oh, it's a validator group. Oh yeah, so That's you. What I see. Yeah, so up to three, right? I yeah, see. so you can vote for up to three different groups. And if uh, any can, of the three is at capacity, my vote will be rejected. Well, you, they're independent. So you say, I want to place. Um, I, I want, have three separate votes. You have three separate votes, uh, with, and you can set different balance at any one time. You have a bunch of lock gold. Mm -hmm. Some of it can be non-voting, and then you can take some of your non-voting gold and place it for a vote for mm -hmm. a group. And yeah, that will be accepted so long as we're below that cap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can take some away and move it to a different group. Wait, wait, so vote is, is, is vote weighted by your gold or? Yep. Vote, uh, balance, comma, group, or like, let's call it value or amount or something. Mm -hmm. V, comma, group. So oh, the same amount you can, really you can, you can cast on three different groups. Uh -huh. The same amount. Uh, okay. Or different amounts. You can but say, but oh, I'm just saying, like, you can have three X. So if I have ten gold, uh -huh. I can vote for thirty. My no, weight can ten, be thirty. If, no, if you have ten gold, you can invalid. If you have ten gold locked, you can do ten golds worth of governance voting yeah. and ten golds worth of validator voting. And so that could be four to one group and six to another, or ten to one, ten to, to just one group. Or like maybe like three and two and. But then whatever. why do you have this limit? I, I can split implementation. Yeah, I can split to ten. Oh, I can split it into ten accounts, right? And yeah. For 10 exactly. Yeah, if you want to, that's fine. This is just an implementation detail. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Remember, we've written this in Solidity. <laughs> that, that's that's a weird excuse, but. <laughs>
What I, I have another. Uh, okay, so go. yeah, I actually wanted uh, mm. some more. Like you said, is there a also like is this weighted by the by their steak or is there like a specific no, amount of flat steak? steak. So, so, so there's a, a couple of interesting things. Yeah. A... One of the, one of the things we wanted to do with this system is like re create like good incentives for mm -hmm. validators to contribute to the security of the system. We wanted to make sure that. It was, the the rewards were interesting for professional validators mm -hmm. who like go to the effort of like properly operating and monitoring like hardware having hardware and colo facilities with like you know potentially hardware security modules or like good security setups mm -hmm. cameras pointed at the cage of the data center and so on that doesn't come cheap but at the same time we also recognize that costs the infrastructure costs here are um, in effect taking rewards out of the pocket of the people who we're building this service for as well, right? So we're trying to balance these uh, concern, the, the, the concerns of different constituencies mm -hmm. here. Like, you know, having, building such a big platform, like we're, like there are many different, like, there are many different, like, constituencies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of, I mean, of, you're optimizing for all the parties, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the, the rewards for validators are flat. They're actually paid in cello dollars mm -hmm. as well, because most of the costs of um, validators and validated groups are actually defrayed in uh, dollars in, the in fiat. In gold, right? Sorry, the stake, is, the in stake is in gold. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is like what is this number like? Is this a governance controlled yeah. number? Governance controlled. Yeah. And and what was it going to be to start with? We're not sure yet. Okay. We're thinking. I mean, it's going to be comparable to the sort of stakes that you're seeing in existing networks, mm -hmm. and the rewards will be comparable and and interesting. Um, I think the the other thing to note is that validators and validated groups, as well as obviously once you've like set this as a stake, you earn um, rewards. We haven't talked about this yet, but you actually earn like rewards for like locking up the gold here, and we do that. Um, so yeah, let's talk about let's talk about that bit. So um, so you lock up gold, you vote for some groups, like. You, there's an election. We run a um, an election which is mm -hmm. exactly the same as um, like a uh, proportional representation election um, as done in say like the European Parliament. Um, it's the same. You, we use a De, the Dehon algorithm, which is the same, which I think is used to like allocate um, houses uh, seats in the House of Representatives from like uh, census data, mm -hmm. and so it's it's widely used for this, this sort of purpose. Um, it basically will um, like determine based on the votes the set of validators that um, are going to be the next validator set. We have an epoch length which is one day. Mm -hmm. At the end of like the last block of every epoch, we go through this process. You can continue to vote. You continue to lock or unlock at any time. Yeah. Um, just but basically, roll it into next epoch. that's right. There's like a snapshot, and at that yeah. point, you you can do. Uh, one thing to say is that there is like a three day unlocking period here. Mm -hmm. um, so you unlock, then you wait. <laughs> Sounds way too familiar. Sounds very familiar yes. <laughs> Interesting. So we, we we went back and forth a lot on this specific uh, time. Like you unlock, then you have to wait three days. The reason it's three days is because um, an epoch is one day. Yeah. Like we want to make sure that if you've participated in an election, that you still have skin in the game, right? So we want to uh, yeah, yeah. we want to um, ensure that you don't just like yeah, come in and do something it, and then exit. That's right. Yeah. If I want to create an attack on the network. Um, by by like you know affecting the results of the validator election by uh, borrowing borrowing funds mm -hmm. um, you know maybe trying to short cello or something um, then use that to purchase a lot of cello gold and then try and swing the election by that vote I want to I you know the system needs to ensure that like you see the consequences in the potential value of mm -hmm. the the ramifications of like the, your actions in terms of uh, in terms of that, which is why we've set three days. We also want it to be short enough that like it's not a, a huge liquidity challenge. So say there's an epoch, mm -hmm. right? And there's a, some sort of validators. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's Alice, Bob, and Carol. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's voting. Voting happens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible that the entire validator set changes? Like, could it be here, Dave, Eve, and uh, Frank? Let's say, or or there's some maximum percentage of validators that can change between epochs? Um, the moment there isn't a maximum percentage that can change, we expect in general that the the churn will be very small. But yeah, at the and moment there's the nothing point. in the algorithm to... Do we know these guys at this point or at this point? 
when do we know who's going to be validated in epoch like this is the epoch key yeah. uh, the lit- last literally on. after all transactions have been at the very last very, okay yeah. so so the validators know they're validating one second before they literally have to start validating right okay <laughs> next question okay that, that's where it gets interesting mm-hmm. um say uh alice bob and carol here mm-hmm. like they were building a chain mm-hmm. uh, oh yeah so one question is is epoch measured in time or a number of blocks number of blocks number of blocks okay so the epoch switches when you have like some like height. one day divided by the block time of blocks yep Epoch length mod yeah. zero, whatever. Yeah. And the block must have two third plus one signatures, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I guess, yeah, that's, that's something so, great. So, so, well, the one question that, I mean, we, we have definitely faced is mm-hmm. that if you think, if so, you're saying these guys need to start validating mm-hmm. one second after this, they actually know they need to validate, mm-hmm. that means they actually need to be like fully synced mm-hmm. and but know they, they, about they, the change. They, 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 they stake to validate. You would expect them to, to be fully synced. It's just weird. They, the validators are running. They're basically like like trying to participate, but yeah. yeah. Being so you're, told ass- you're assuming like every, all of them are running all the uh-huh. time, and then some of them get selected actually yeah. and get rewarded, yeah, yeah. and then sometimes they may not be rewarded. And, and is it uh, sampled uh, randomly from the set of people who want, or is it highest? Yes, we run uh, this. Votes. Right. So we run votes. we yeah, we yeah. run this PR election, yeah. this proportional representative, and so that chooses the set. Then we shuffle the set mm-hmm. um, because it's important that we don't want folks who we don't want folks who, to, who can to be able to engineer the number of votes they get to be able to determine the order in which the proposer rotates. Mm-hmm. So then we shuffle. Um, we have a source of on-chain randomness as well, um, and that's what we use to shuffle. And then basically, the diff of that validator set is like encoded in the uh, extra data of the header yeah. of For the last block. Yeah. And so for the light cl- so, so one of the things we've actually done, you know, going back to like the mobile first piece, one of the things we've actually done is like, this gives you some interesting opportunities to make like the light client sync protocol mm-hmm. a lot uh, more efficient. So, you- so so the proposal for the PBFT, yeah. is, is it a pre- fixed schedule or it's random at every block? It's a it's it's sh- it's a sh- shuffled permutate like a random permutation. Okay, but but deterministic, like within, deterministic. Within the epoch, it's deterministic. Yeah. 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 Uh, what what is the source of on-chain randomness? Basically, every validator is like a commit reveal scheme. Every validator like um, puts in a like uh, uh, like a, the hash like determines a random so it's number. Randau. Sorry. Randau. I don't. Effectively. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what Randau. I don't. But, but I don't that, know that, that scheme. That means that validators have uh, like every validator has one bit of influence, right? Mm-hmm. Because they can choose to re- reveal reveal or not to reveal. Uh, they can go offline. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. Or, or they can choose not to reveal, right? I mean. So, so that gives them. So it's not it's not unbiasable per se, right? Every. every it's not perfect. Has, no, yeah, it's not perfect. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and so in certain other places, um, you know, in certain other situations or certain other sort of parts of the protocol, we end up doing things like waiting a certain like the the chance that you can influence the proposer more or the sequence of proposers for more than n consecutive blocks mm-hmm. ends up like falling off extremely yeah. rapidly. Uh, it, and the, the block, so the block proposer, mm-hmm. they choose which transactions to include, right? Yep. So at every, okay. Yep. And then everybody else just Which is votes. true with Ethereum, yeah, right? Yeah, There's, I mean, it's very hard to prove a negative. Like mm-hmm. it's very <laughs> hard to force somebody yeah. to include a transaction when there's yeah. no like mechanism to um, like prove that they actually did receive a yeah, transaction. Yeah. Yep. Um, but so the proposer does receive transaction fees. We've changed the gas pricing mechanism for compared to what Ethereum does. We use like a, a sort of surge pricing mechanism, which actually uh, Vitalik proposed in an EIP a number of years. We, we came up with a scheme and then we found that Vitalik had also proposed a similar scheme. And then we were like, okay, we just adjustment as create a, a hybrid as of these the two amount things. of gas in the block gets filled, do you just adjust price a little bit higher? Yeah, like, so uh, rather than stepping back over here onto my other shard of the whiteboard, <laughs> shard zero, <laughs> I will, um, yeah, so like rather than have a block like this and have transactions in the block filling up mm-hmm. up to here and basically picking the highest price yep. transactions first and just filling uh, to a fixed limit, what we do is we, set, we end up setting... The 2x limit and then... Yeah, basically we say, oh, 
actually, like, this is our hard limit. Yeah, yeah. And, and if, it's high, if it's above, then you yeah. increase price. If it's below, you increase right. price. Yeah, and so then we have a target, which is some fraction of, of this. So mm -hmm. say, like in your example, half. And so we, um, this is like basically a gas price minimum. And so we, we have the opportunity to burst if there are loads of transactions that arrive mm -hmm. in a short space of time. Obviously, like the workload is going to end up being bursty, especially at peak time. Um, and so you can fill up up mm -hmm. to here but in that case what happens is like your gas price minimum ends up changing for the next block by a protocol determined alpha yeah yeah alpha right and so you do this walk whereby mm -hmm. um yeah we use the same so yeah that's why there you go. <laughs> what is the incentive the, for the, the great minds think alike yeah. yeah what is the incentive for ellis bob and carol to include the uh, votes which are not for them vote is a transaction right um, why, would, why would I like you may imagine like there's a validator group Alice mm -hmm. or Carol and somebody votes for Dan and, and someone says I mm -hmm. want to vote for Dave mm -hmm. what is the incentive for me to include the vote the transaction fee is probably negligibly small but it, it increases my chance of not being a validator next next week I mean you're right from the point of view that the validators want like the two-thirds elected validator like basically you can do anything you like when you're yeah. a, when you're a sort of Byzantine quorum of like elected validators mm -hmm. during the period in which you're elected. Yeah. So, uh, yep, you can that, and there's there's sort of no way around that, right? It's a BFT assumption that two thirds of your validators are honest. Well, not necessarily. There's a, you, you can build a system where two, two thirds of them are reasonable, where two thirds are honest. So effectively, right. it's it's like my general concern when when designing protocols that mm -hmm. uh, it could be that for me. Mm -hmm. There's something like uh, there's a change I can introduce to my client, mm -hmm. which will not hurt me at all. Mm -hmm. For example, as a as a solo validator, I can mm -hmm. make a change to my client, which says does not accept any votes. Do mm -hmm. not do not vote for blocks that have votes for other validators, or do not mm -hmm. vote yourself, mm -hmm. which is gonna hurt me a little bit, mm -hmm. but maybe not too much. Yep. Right. Uh, and well, actually, it does hurt a little bit because if I don't vote, it hurts. No, no. But actually, I mean that's that, that. I mean, I think if you look at this, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you if you look at this, like the there's probably going to be some distribution on the votes. Right, and so the validators at the top of the distribution, yeah, yeah, they, have no they have no incentive to like exclude votes that are not gonna like. You can calculate: is this vote gonna push me out of the validator set? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be false for everybody except for the like bottom like on the validator, bottom ones, yeah. right? Yeah. So you could imagine I guess bottom like bottom validator not proposing. I mean, they they, are, they already borderline yeah. there. They probably don't want to alienate people by not yeah. their votes. So yeah. so the question is, well, it, and remember that. Sorry, remember that if uh, even if a transaction does not appear in one particular block, it's yeah, been yeah, gossiped it's and it, yeah. exactly everybody, well, two thirds, well, two -thirds, needs, yes. to, two yeah. thirds need to censor it. And yeah. so like, because there is well, this transaction fee, sure, it's relatively modest, but of course you have to balance that against like making it affordable for people to send mm -hmm. transactions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I, if I, as a validator, don't vote or don't publish my block to use pretty much slash them for right. Live, liveness. Right, so yeah, so coming back to oh, like... Oh, is this take slashable, by the way? Aha, uh -huh. yes. Okay, this is slashable, okay. Yes. It's just the, the votes which are not slashable. Yes, and when you register to be a validator group or a validator, you, uh, we check that you have um, locked gold up to, like, uh, of the certain required level. Mm -hmm. um, and when you deregister, we uh, basically only allow you to deregister like a certain time period after you have like last been elected. Mm -hmm. So there's an additional lockup period for validators and validator groups. So, you know, at the moment we're thinking that this is probably something like 60 days for like validators, uh, potentially like longer for validator groups. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that like, you know, while that sort of creates this nice balance, because if you're just like a voter, then well, you well, get why, to... Why not three days as well? Why not three days? Yeah. Um, this is to do with the... Um, this is to do with like long range attacks and the consequences of basically keeping your need the, the requirement for us to like keep validators to keep their keys secure after they have mm -hmm. um, uh, basically like stopped being like oh, so part of the hypothesis is set. that executing long range attack four days ago is easier than 60 days. 65 days ago. Uh, yeah. And so this I is guess. like the longest of th these periods here. So the max of this and this plus on top of this mm -hmm. is like essentially your objectivity window. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, so, so anyway, so talking about, oh, go on. Yeah, yeah. no, I just wanted to understand, yeah, if what, what happens when you don't like pretty much 
I mean, there's two questions. One mm -hmm. is like if I just don't show up, right, or don't mm -hmm. approve something. Mm -hmm. And then the other question, if it's a 60 days and you said you can only release only after you are not in the selection, uh, you weren't selected, mm -hmm. how do you actually stop being selected? <laughs> <laughs> so at any time, you can basically leave a group. Like validators are sort of sovereign in the sense that they okay, can choose so they to can leave, leave a group, a group. at any okay, time. Okay. A validator group can also kick you out at any time, as okay. you would expect. Um, and so, you know, if you know that you're going to go down for downtime and you only have one machine, of yeah. course, it's absolutely in your interest. So, like, those changes don't take effect, of course, until the end of the, end of the epoch. Mm -hmm. Like, nothing happens until the end of the epoch from an yeah. election point of view. Um, uh, so, yeah, let's talk about, like, rewards and uptime and things. So, validators and validator groups receive rewards. Mm -hmm. Um, which are basically factored from like this sort of baseline fee that we would like to pay, um, and what we what we have to do then is like look at so we start so so Cello has like um, like a fixed total supply cap, mm -hmm. um, and there's a certain amount that's allocated in the Genesis block, and then the rest of this is allocated over time through. Um, basically epoch rewards. Mm -hmm. So we don't have block rewards like yeah. Ethereum does. We have epoch rewards code. given out at the end of every epoch. Yep. And same. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> so I mean, like, there's no point. Like, if it's the right. same people, just give it them at the end. Right, yeah. right, right. And so um, those rewards go to Solo Gold holders. Um, they go to validator groups, mm -hmm. uh, different rewards. They go to validators. And they also go to a few other things. So we have an infrastructure fund, mm -hmm. which is, like, basically for... Um, projects which can be like dis dispersed by the uh, governance yeah. proposal so mm -hmm. like cello gold holders can vote to give a certain amount of money to developers or to people who are otherwise improving the network mm -hmm. um, we also have a carbon offsetting fund mm -hmm. so basically we want to make this whole platform and project carbon neutral mm -hmm. and to do that like the gold cello gold holders can vote to like basically there's an address and there's an amount and mm -hmm. like every epoch that address receives that amount. Mm. Super simple technically, but like what it means is that validators and validators, we're not relying on these guys individually to like, you know, um, offset the sort of environmental effects of like running the machines that they're mm. doing. And then on top of that, we also have um, the stablecoin has a reserve. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways in which we can top up that reserve if we feel it's under collateralized due to is to, buy, yeah, to, is buy to basically divert some of the epoch rewards mm -hmm. over to that and so yeah um and in any given so that means that at any given epoch you you can end up uh having uh, different like needs on your funds mm -hmm. right maybe you need to pay more to the reserve yeah maybe uh like all the validators had really terrible uptime and you've decided not to pay them very much. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe um, cello gold holders as well are going to get less money, and I'll explain why in a sec. But you, 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 this is your sort of target schedule, right? This mm -hmm. is how much you'd like to be spending in a sort of target. Uh, and maybe this is how much you have spent, mm -hmm. right? And this could be actually like either like you, you're overspending. I mean, it should be monetarily increasing, right? <sighs> <laughs> Just, just double checking. No, no, no. Absolutely <laughs> right. I guess like when you're sort of at the whiteboard at this angle, you're sort of... Actually, that's, that's, yeah, nobody's given money back to this thing. Just <laughs> clarify that for... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh, okay, let's start again. So I'm always spending money. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm spending money at a slightly different gradient mm -hmm. each... Ah, oh, damn it. Each time, <laughs> right? So I'm either overspending or, or underspending, yeah. right? So I can afford to be a bit more generous mm -hmm. or I can afford, you know, I can't afford to like give out as much as we want. So we have this like target adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, so we have like, basically, this is the target that we would like to hit yeah, yeah. for like payments to validators, which is say this number of cello dollars. Um, and then we either we adjust it up or down based on like overspend or underspend. Um, and so we say, okay, so actually, you know, we've been spending a ton, so we can only afford this much. And then what we do is we look at a couple of things. So the first thing we look at is like uptime. Mm -hmm. And the way we look at uptime is for every block that we are, every proposer um, includes in that block the, all of the signatures that they've collected from the previous block mm -hmm. as well. 
So all of the, the signatures. Um, by the way, we use BLS signatures, um, uh, actually validators of two keys, they have an ECDSA key and a, a BLS key. We use BLS signatures because we can aggregate them. Overall, they're smaller mm -hmm. improvements to the light client protocol. Um, so what that means is that we don't need to wait around. Mm -hmm. So I guess that piece is the only it's pipeline, pipeline yeah. piece that we have <laughs> right now. So we don't wait around. As soon as you like, you know, receive two uh, F plus one like commits, mm -hmm. then like that block is done. But from that point forward, we'll still collect signatures, collect signatures from the previous there. block. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the subsequent proposer will also be doing this and will include all of those signatures. And to do what, what will happen there is that those signatures will be used for this uptime calculation. Mm -hmm. So now we use a sliding window. We currently, we're thinking like 10. So long as you've been, your signature has been included in, in at least 10. one of the last 10, mm -hmm. we consider you up for that block. Mm -hmm. So it's like a sort of simple sliding window. And the reason for that is of course like, you know, if, if I'm a malicious validator, yeah, you know, just start censoring. Yeah, I would start censoring these things and like. Uh, but yeah. uh, if I miss the block, is that considered a? No. Okay. No. So, so if you if you miss the block, then um, if your signature is not included in the block. No, but you, like I didn't produce you, you, a block cannot, at all. You cannot mm. miss a block. In PBFT, it's just going to be a view change. Oh, okay. Never mind. Right. You mean like yeah, if yeah. I'm you're meant to be the proposer? Yeah. If, if yeah. I yeah if I got a view change, right. pretty much. Yeah. But view change is expensive for this system, right? It is. Yeah, we don't it, it, we it don't penalize that right now. I mean, we're not assuming like this is sort of we're assuming that like most the reason that most honest nodes would end up being down is because of misconfiguration, <laughs> network problem, like you know power supply failure, that sort of, you know, hardware the failure. The usual thing, yeah. The usual things, exactly. But the, like, but the view changes, they have exponential backup, right? Uh, they do. Yeah. They so do. So it's like if a couple of people miss their proposals, then, then it's like many, many seconds without the block, right? Uh, so they typically, uh, yeah, so if a proposer doesn't propose, then obviously then you do get this additional, yeah. like, timeout. Um, but, like, I mean, it's not a massive delay. Mm. Uh, and obviously, because we shuffle the validators, well, the it's very time? hard. What is the timeout between two blocks under no normal circumstances? Uh, so current, yeah, so currently we're set to three seconds plus the regular block delay. So the, the system has a parameter of block delay Say, hey, we want to make a block every five seconds. So mm -hmm. if everyone else hasn't seen a block after three seconds plus that time, then that's when everyone will send random change messages. So from that point forward, we then take that, say, five seconds off. Mm -hmm. And then that's the basis from which we do exponential back off um, up until a certain like window. And, and is it actually five seconds, the block production delay? I mean, TBD, that's sort of what we've been uh, trying at the moment. Yeah. Um, we can easily handle 100 validators with that. You've got a choice of do you want to increase the number of validators, include increase decentralization, or do you want to increase, like, the uh, reduce the latency for transaction finalization for these guys? Cool. Yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, let's talk yeah, about the stablecoin part. Yep, sounds great. Um, there's a bunch more stuff in the proof of stake thing, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like have a, have a look at our blog posts um, and uh, yeah, definitely encouraging people to think they might be interested as validators to participate mm -hmm. in their great solo stake offer too. Yeah, so how does sell a dollar work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So of course, there are a whole bunch of different types of like stablecoin yeah. out there. There's like, you know, fiat collateralized, um, crypto collateralized, and then sort of... Algorithmic, yeah, balancing out. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Um, and so Celo's, um, Celo firstly is like a sort of family of stable coins, mm -hmm. I would say. It's like relatively easy through governance to propose and create like new stable new coins. Form, okay. Right now, we've only been thinking in terms of like one. one approach. Like, yeah, and the obvious place to start is Celo dollar, like mm -hmm. a stable coin that's pegged to the dollar. Also interested in stable coins, which are not just necessarily pegged to regular fiat currency. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of... Well, there's a SR... What's it called? SRD or something? The... Yeah, so I think I know the thing you're talking about. Um, yeah, so um, our uh, chairman, uh, Sep Kamva, did a talk at uh, DevCon recently mm -hmm. about like yeah, exactly. about that. And so, yeah, if, if folks are interested, they can check that out. Um, but yeah, so the stablecoin mechanism is uh, backed by a reserve, mm -hmm. which sort of combines... Um, uh, Celo Gold, mm -hmm. uh, the native like utility token yeah. of, the, of the system, with um, which is obviously decentralized, with like a reserve of other crypto assets as well. Mm -hmm. And so you know that might be Bitcoin, might be like ETH, 
might be other things, might be other stable coins, especially initially we're thinking that it could be very interesting to include other stable coins, mm -hmm. um, especially fiat backed stable coins in that um, place. Of course, those things exist on different chains. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very difficult to like um, manage that piece of the reserve in a decentralized way, although that is absolutely our aim. Initially, this will be done in a centralized fashion so mm -hmm. that we have like a multi sig pretty much. Or... Yeah, so we have basically like um, uh, holdings of these things on mm -hmm. different chains, maybe at exchanges. We have a bunch of like, you know, uh, algorithms which look at this reserve, decide mm -hmm. whether we want to rebalance it in terms of like, you know, the various volatility or price of, mm -hmm. uh, the prices of these things um, to maintain like target ratios between them. Um, and so like this is going to be centralized to start with, like heading towards being like decentralized. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of even while being centralized from an implementation point of view, in practice, the Cello Foundation will um, nominate and fellow gold holders will have a, a say in like how, who and how this like who reserve has the is managed. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we have we have this reserve anyway. So mm -hmm. you can see that this is already like a sort of hybrid of like the sort of existing approaches. Um, so is this reserve, this is over cartelization reserve. Yeah. So similar like maker, mm -hmm. like if you remove this part, this will be like a maker design. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks, looks pretty similar. Um, I think, uh, and of course, like depending on the volatility of these assets, mm -hmm. we're going to want to change that. The balance. Yeah. Exactly. That collateralization. So ratio. what's your like collateralization ratio for seller gold, for example? Um, that I couldn't tell you. Okay. <laughs> I guess it depends on the value of this, but like, um, you know, there are there are a few things. Uh, what we basically have is like a series of oracles. Mm -hmm. We do depend on oracles, of course, to like provide price signals. Yeah. Um, the essentially the exchange rate between like cello so gold and cello dollars. Well, and in dollars, I guess. So regular dollars, indeed. <laughs> yep. Um, Would it have been great to have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two crypto. Uh, <laughs> pricing, anyway. Um, so um, and just quick, uh, how how do you like implement that in practice? Like, is it just a like fixed set of yeah. selected entities, so or there's like th some more interesting design? That's right. So there's nothing particularly uh, okay. exciting about this bit yet. Um, we're going to be turning our, our our eyes to think a lot more about mm -hmm. this. At the moment, the setup. So for our test net, the setup is going to be that we run a single like Oracle and that it publishes mm -hmm. um, price information yeah. on chain. Uh, we already have a bunch of like safeguards on chain to ensure that like you know if there were multiple price signals that we're always taking the median we mm -hmm. don't allow the price to move by more than a certain amount each time mm -hmm. um you know a bunch of other bunch of yeah. other things but you can imagine like you know these things putting up stakes and getting rewards um, um but yeah that's an area which we sort of um, are going to be like postponed. It. Yeah, <laughs> postponed. Yeah, exactly. So these things provide an exchange rate, mm -hmm. um, and of course, like you know, there's uh, several ways we're going to want to like be able to bolster the reserve under mm -hmm. conditions where we see high volatility or we yeah. feel we're under collateralized. Um, several different ways of doing that. First is we have a stability fee mm -hmm. um, on. Uh, so maybe maybe stepping one one yep. one bit back is. This reserve and the, and the issuance of, of a dollar, who is actually responsible for it? Am I, as a user, pretty much can lock in some gold and get some dollar? Exactly. Or yeah. okay. is it actually like a... Yeah. So let's talk about that bit first then. So yeah, so we, um, that is all decentralized and we have a sort of decentralized one-to-one -one exchange um, I mean, I don't know quite why I've drawn a circle, but I guess like you can have a person up here mm -hmm. and you can have the reserve down here. Um, this basically, uh, so we have like, um, you can use, you can basically purchase dollars yeah, and that increases, expands the supply. Um, and then you can also like do the opposite and you, you can, can like sell, sell dollars, dollars for buy, the, yeah. exactly for the current, uh, for, for the current price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this, this is totally on chain and totally mm -hmm. decentralized. It does, of course, depend on the Oracle price. Yeah. Um, in all, and of course, if the Oracle price is wrong, then there is a risk that you can like have a... You buy it too cheap or yeah. Yeah, and so therefore you can deplete the reserve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so these are mechanisms here whereby mm -hmm. we can like bolster the reserve as well. And that's 
also valuable to people who are under collateralized because of volatility increases. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a sort of uniswap like mechanism whereby it sort of creates this negative feedback loop around price shifts. Mm-hmm. So if the balance of trading from one to the other like shifts away from parity, then what we end up doing is increasing the price mm-hmm. like against that. So providing, making it increasingly expensive to move, um, to move the supply the pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I see. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's like, and there's a few things in here, which one of which so we already talked about, like epoch rewards, mm-hmm. you can use that to, um, should do the arrow the other way around, all of these things can like, mm-hmm. so, and then also like a, uh, basically a tax on transfers of solo, uh, of solo gold, like essentially a Tobin tax, uh, mm-hmm. which, can, which can kick in. How does that work? So, um, Basically, it doesn't always apply, uh-huh. but if uh, if the reserve is very sh- running short, mm-hmm. then we can like basically uh, any transfer of cello gold can is like, like contributes to yeah this. contributes. Right, so it's just like this. pump up the pretty much the exactly. price or like the transaction fee, but instead of spending gas, you're actually having like percentage right. going to the yeah, reserve. That's, that's right. Mm. Yeah, and so the stability fee is. Um, a sort of demurrage fee mm-hmm. on like dollar balances. Yeah. Like dollar is the, the solo dollar is really like, like issued by a bank, which actually like wants percentage back as a. You uh, can, I guess you can think of it as like you know this is a token that's for exchange. Yeah. And so there's an incentive to to, for, to like we need an incentive to yeah, like should, keep these like, things keep, exchanging keep circulating, and yeah. circulating the high velocity. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so this is like roughly the, mm-hmm. the mechanism. And so, you know, obviously part of the concern with this was like, well, you know, holding a basket of crypto assets. But also, I mean, how does this basket of crypto assets actually work with everything else, right? Like you cannot issue more Bitcoin, right. so obviously. So, so yes. And also like exchanging is hard. Yeah, so, so you need you need to basically... Okay, so you have a rebalancing where you like take right. some gold, sell it, and buy some Bitcoin right. and Ethereum, yep. and then going backwards yeah. to just provide more yeah. And we hope stability. to be able to bring more of that onto the chain through mm-hmm. like cross-chain links yeah, like, yeah. later on. Um, so yeah, so then then the question is like, is this going to work in practice? Mm-hmm. We have done a ton. We we have many people um, like far smarter than I am, like looking at uh, who have PhDs in economics, like thinking hard about this sort of situation. We've done a ton of like stability simulation analysis, mm-hmm. uh, which we have a white paper on, uh, which, which talks a lot about like you know, the particular situation we're concerned about is like if you have a basket of crypto assets and a sort of um, you have a rapid crash in the market, like uh, like we've seen, <laughs> like, like we've seen, absolutely. Um, you know what does what does that do to the peg? Mm-hmm. And so we plotted a bunch of those scenarios and uh, looked at the paths there, looked at the sort of mechanisms that we had available to us in terms of keeping the reserve. We were able to like um, like keep a peg mm-hmm. in all of the sort of simulation paths that we looked at, and um, yeah. I think we had that that informed a lot of the sort of parameters that we're gonna like set this thing up with mm-hmm. in, in, in sort of starting point. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty interesting. All right. And then like identity mechanism, John. Sure, quick, yeah. Quick, well, so one of the things so you know, from a user's perspective, there's a bunch of things you wanna wanna do, right? Mm-hmm. Like um, firstly you don't necessarily want to like be paying in currencies which are like you volatile, don't recognize yeah. or which are volatile. You want currencies which feel familiar to you and mm-hmm. wh- whose value is familiar to you. And so like that's where the stable coin mechanism comes in. You want a platform where it just works from your mobile device, which yep. is where a lot of the infrastructure that we built comes in. We also allow you to pay for transaction fees in any currency. Mm-hmm. So we've modified like the sort of uh, transaction fee payment mechanism uh, so that like validators can basically collect transaction fees. Does it need to whitelist them brackets. or like yep. literally anything can work? No, no, so like I can launch my own there. So you can, uh... <laughs> can launch your <laughs> uh, Yes, so it's basically governable. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. There's a governable whitelist of mm-hmm. like, hey validators, these are the currencies which uh, you should you accept. Should accept. And yeah. the, do they receive the currency or do they receive the doll? Like they the receive the dollar? currency. Okay. They receive the currency because... So they need to go and find out how to like... Right, so we there's no dependency on like the Oracle yeah, price that's... at that point. Yep, well spotted. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, and the third thing is like, you know, I download an app and I've got a bunch of contacts, I've mm-hmm. got a contact list, and I want to sp- 
like send money to and receive money from my contact list. So to do that, I, like I give the app permission, mm -hmm. and of course the contact list has a bunch of phone numbers in it. So what we have is a mapping from basically from phone numbers to addresses. Yeah. And um, we, of course, want that to be secure so that nobody else can <laughs> say, <laughs> that, hey, yes. I'm, exactly, hey, I'm, uh, I'm actually Tim. And so, you know, I think you think you're paying me mm -hmm. and you're actually paying like some attacker. Um, and of course, it's like the security is all about like new transfers. It's not about like access to existing balances. So to do that, we have a, a decentralized mechanism for like verifying phone, number phone numbers. Yeah, so there's a couple of different pieces of this. So the first thing is that like a user, like in the onboarding flow mm -hmm. of the app, the user can request verification. Mm -hmm. So they pay a small verification fee um, that covers the cost of sending like N text messages. In fact, they can choose what N is, the client mm -hmm. can choose what N is. But of course, from like a sim for a simple user experience, like that number is essentially fixed. Um, and then what happens is, this is like a, it's like a flow. Um, where am I going to draw this down here? This is a flow, so like you basically do a request. Mm -hmm. um, then you wait four blocks. If this was in block B, this ends up being in block B plus four. Mm -hmm. The reason for this is it makes it like infeasibly difficult to control the randomness between this point. Um, what you're re really requesting is like you're saying, hey, I want my account to be associated with this hash. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, you're saying, um, okay, so like, you know, select, uh, s select who's going to attest me, mm -hmm. uh, who's going to provide attestations. Um, and at that point, like we use the randomness to basically pick uh, four validators mm -hmm. who are going to be in charge of like getting... Send the SMS and yeah, verifying. That's right. So they ha need to run like a Twilio connect or something? To... Yeah, sort of. So it's like this attestation service. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, in fact, every validator in Solo runs like three processes or potentially more. So like the standard setup is like, there's a validator, there's a sentry, um, this thing like hides the validator from the rest of the world, proxies all of their, when I say sentry, what I really mean is proxy. Yeah. Um, terminology's changing. <laughs> so we, um, and then uh, you also run like an attestation service. And a zookeeper. <laughs> 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 so then, uh, so later we may we'll probably be doing like threshold validation. So like, there's a bunch of different like nodes, v three, v two, v one, which all have a shard of like the actual uh, keys, mm -hmm. and uh, you need like two out of three or whatever to combine them mm -hmm. to be able to do signatures. Um, we'll also support like multiple proxies, mm -hmm. but like the basic setup is yeah. with those three. Um, so the attestation service, basically you find out the validators, you find out the identity of the validators who, um, when you ask them to send a text and they send that through to you signed by their attestation key, you can then submit that back on chain. Mm -hmm. And that is like the thing which says, yes, the protocol believes that you have access to this phone number, mm -hmm. this account. So how, how does, where's, how's no phone number actually recorded on chain? So we, uh, we, we never record the phone number itself. We record yeah. like a sorted hash. Um, and we will be like changing that over to use like S script, I think as well. So the, uh, yeah. So, so, so basically there's a Wait, mapping. So if it's a sorted hash, how mm -hmm. the, like, so the, the question I always had was if, if it's a sorted hash, yeah. then I need to know the salt to verify that this is you, right? Right. If it's. Like yeah, so so you're you're right that this um, obviously all of this data is like available on chain and uh, uh, there is like a, a sort of diction there is like a sort of attack whereby I can sort of I can basically go through and find out like I can sort of rainbow for, for any sort of phone thing. yeah yeah I can basically the, also the space of valid phone numbers is not like a very exactly yeah. large like input space um, so. So I can, in theory, map every like phone number to an address. Mm -hmm. Yep, in theory. So um, one of the things we've been thinking about is like, how do we get around this? Yeah. Um, and so we actually have like an accounts mechanism. So this this is not what we have right now, but mm -hmm. it's like something we're working on. So we have an accounts mechanism. So this is like the way that validators can record metadata about themselves. Yeah. They can claim, hey, I've got access to this DNS. I've got access to this key base account mm -hmm. and so on. It's also the place where like individual account holders can record a public key. Mm -hmm. And so 
that's we also support like encrypted comments in transactions so that I can like send you a bunch of emojis to indicate that I'm paying you for coffee. Mm -hmm. And so that ends up going into like using that public key to basically encrypt that comment. That same public key can rather than basically so so there's a mechanism whereby we'll be able to say, hey, actually don't send um don't send to this address, send all, all, all the funds should be sent to like an address which you can communicate, which you can basically use this public key to go and communicate with me for. So that public key is like, hey, let's go and do some out of band communication and I'll tell you where to send the funds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is the piece which is like not yet like implemented because it requires a bunch of like, we need to figure out exactly how and where to like do that communication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So j just uh, for for one sec, you said it's a sorted hash. Mm -hmm. Why do you sort it? Then? I think it's a sorted hash. Hmm? I think it's a sorted hash. You're pushing my uh, my. B because if it's sorted, then it's useless. Because yeah, right. If I have a phone number, I don't know the salt. Yeah. If it's not, um, yeah, it's this is what I, I, to, to, like, to my... like the problem is that what you're trying to achieve is also the reverse of pri of privacy, right? Because you're yeah. trying to like by me knowing phone number, I can find your account. It's really tough. Yeah, yeah. it's really tough. So, um, right. And well, in, in a public setting, yeah. yeah and yeah. so this is like an area, like, you know, privacy is going to be a significant focus for us. Like, you know, uh, private transactions, yeah. private, private, like, balances, private amounts, mm -hmm. um, like, making this mapping as private as possible. But there is, as you point out, this fundamental tension between yeah. what you're trying to build is a phone book. Yeah. Right. And then you also don't want it to be public for everyone. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we have think we have been thinking about that yeah. as well, and we actually have some ideas how to do it like peer to peer yeah. gossip style. Right. So the way that you yeah, that's, use that's kind of, yeah, is basically yeah. doing yeah. A, a peer to peer gossip style mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, the era of phone books was not so bad, right? Like. Um, well, except that that phone book did not have like attached balance to how much money that person has <laughs> when, when I actually want to track them down, and you know. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but like you can imagine, you know, there's. That isn't to say that's the only like account that this entity exactly, has, yeah, right? Yeah. That is just their inbox, right? And so one of the things that you can like do from the client perspective is like use that as an inbox and like withdraw funds from that. Yeah. Of course, then and then you, like, you see all everything that's coming in. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah it's, <laughs> it's a cha it's a challenging problem. Yeah. yeah. And it's one we're you know spending a lot of time thinking about. All right. Cool. All right. I mean, it's uh, really cool stuff and. Uh, I think we're cool. good on time. So yeah, awesome. thanks a lot. Yeah, well, thanks for taking yeah. the time. It's, uh, and, yeah, it's been please a lot of fun. check out uh, Sela .org. Sela org and yeah, the upcoming Bake Off. Yeah, that exactly. Cool Stake Off. Stake Off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, cheers. Cheers. Yeah.